So welcome to our second video of the semester. Today we're going to talk a little bit about smooth muscle. Now I have to start off with a uh, sort of confession and that is I made a huge error when I was talking to you guys in class and that is that I said that smooth muscle was activated by acetylcholine. And in fact it is not activated by acetylcholine. And we should have sort of thought this out because we talked about that things were activated by the sympathetic nervous system the smooth muscle was activated by the sympathetic nervous system. And as we all remember from last semester, what activates the sympathetic nervous system is release from the postganglionic neuron of norepinephrine, right, onto adrenergic receptors. So, in fact, what activates smooth muscle is norepinephrine going on to adrenergic receptors. So everything else I said is essentially the same. That is, if we look at this muscle, we would have a vasomotor tone in which a small amount of norepinephrine was constantly being released onto the vessel. And as that was occurring, the smooth muscle there would be slightly contracted and the vessel would have a certain size. If we wanted to have vasodilation, make the vessel larger, what we do is we simply release less norepinephrine. And as we release less norepinephrine, the smooth muscle is less constricted and we would have vaso, excuse me, vasodilation, so more flow through this vessel. Likewise, if we want to have vasoconstriction, we can release more norepinephrine. Right? And uh, again, that is going to cause the smooth muscle to become more contracted make the tube smaller, and we would have less flow. So let's take a look at smooth muscle. Now, we're taking a smooth mu uh, looking at smooth muscle that's arranged in the tunica media. So I'm going to draw a bit of our tunica media and put a little bit of the smooth muscle cells in there. Remember, they look like kind of like little spindles or little worms. And when we're talking about these cells, um, the release of neurotransmitters that enter onto them is a little unusual. And that is the nerve that comes in that's going to supply neurotransmitter to these cells and potentially activate them uh, has little things on them called varicosity. So we, once you look at a little neuron, it has several different big bumps along its surface. And these big bumps are filled with neurotransmitter, right? And that neurotransmitter, remember, is norepinephrine. And uh, I'm drawing a few of these little bumps, but there would in fact be more of them. Each one of these bumps is called a varicosity. Right? We've seen this word before because we talk about varicose veins. Those are veins that have bumps on them. Here are some neurons that have bumps on them. Now, the reason this is interesting is that what's going to occur here is not a very controlled release of a neurotransmitter onto the muscle like we would have in skeletal muscle. Instead, what's going to happen is a release of a cloud of neurotransmitter that's going to affect cells over a large area. So, for example, if we were to look at this, and uh, we would see that if we look closely in a skeletal muscle, we would have a end plate, and the acetylcholine release would be confined to a very small area. In contrast, when we're talking about smooth muscles, the varicosities are going to make us excrete uh, our neurotransmitter or norepinephrine over a broad area. So, for example, here's some smooth muscle cells over some area, and let's say our varicosity is here, like so, sitting on top of it. The neurotransmitter that's released from that is going to affect a very, very large area. And what that's going to do is it's going to activate all these cells at approximately the same time. Um, so this is a little bit of a different system. We're going to activate a lot of cells at once from this one release. And that's going to help coordinate the contraction of smooth muscle. So now we're going to move inside some smooth muscle and look at some of the structures they have that makes these uh, particular types of muscles very interesting. So again, I mentioned they look kind of like little worms like so, and we're going to be looking at one sort of looking down onto the surface, right? So you imagine the tunica media is running like this, and I've caught a cross-section, I'm looking down on a cell. We have a nucleus in the center, of course, 
And the first thing that you notice about these cells is they are non-striated. I cannot see any actin and myosin filaments. Now those actin and myosin filaments are there, right? In fact, what we have is an arrangement of these filaments that's sort of irregular. So for example, if we're looking at actin, which again is called the thin filament, we would see that these are arranged in patterns that are irregular in many, many different angles. So if these contract, the entire cell just kind of balls up, right? It's like a little worm that, or I should say a slug that you pour some salt on, right? Uh, kind of a bad image, but you get the idea. So, um, of course, these actin filaments don't really do a lot. If they're just sort of hanging out in the cell, they have to be attached to something. Now, when we're talking about skeletal muscle, they're attached to Z-discs. Here, they are also attached to something. They are attached to something called dense bodies. And these are the equivalent of the Z-disc in skeletal muscle. We also have the thick filament, or myosin, is present. And um, I'm not going to draw it, but you could imagine everywhere you see a thin filament, everywhere you see some actin, there are some myosin there that could potentially, uh, is, is sort of shadowing it. And when uh, that myosin is activated, it's going to pull those actins together. So there is actin there. I should say there is myosin there. Now, the last thing we want to talk about are some receptors, right? We would have receptors here on the surface for various neurotransmitters. So we would have, for example, a, a receptor for norepinephrine, that of course is an adrenergic receptor. We also have some channels present, so for example we have the equivalent of the DHP channel is also present in these cells. Now, when we talked about cardiac muscle, we said that the DHP receptor was a calcium channel, it allowed calcium into the cell. That in fact is the case here. And when we talked about cardiac muscle, remember that the calcium that comes in here is going to activate uh, the release of calcium from the sarcoposic reticulum. And that is also going on here. So we would also have, for example, a sarcoposic reticulum filled with calcium that would have receptors that would respond to this calcium coming in the DHP channel. Now we're going to see there's some other odd, peculiar things that are going on here. So I'm going to uh, leave it at that as far as, uh, as, th as things set right now. And then we're going to talk about the mechanisms of causing this muscle to contract. Because it turns out they're fairly complicated, but I'm going to go over a few things uh, that will hopefully give you an idea of the flavor of what's going on here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how smooth muscle is going to contract, what are going to be some factors that are important for contraction here. Now, I'm going to start off by saying that the function of smooth muscle is extremely complicated. Um, there are a lot of different things that are going on, we don't quite understand a lot of those. Some of these are going to go, be going on in some smooth muscle in some areas and not in others. I'm just going to try to give you a little bit of flavor for some of that complexity um, and uh, we'll decide on the um, greatest hits what exactly I would like you to know. Okay, so we're first of all going to look the way calcium is handled in smooth muscle. So I'm going to draw the surface of some smooth muscle and we're going to draw a few players that could potentially bring calcium levels up in the smooth muscle. And as we know, if calcium levels increase, that is going to be one of the things that is necessary for a muscle to contract. Okay, so first of all, we have our friend the DHP receptor. And uh, this, again, is a voltage-gated channel. That will allow calcium into the cell. So what will happen if we have a cell that is, becomes depolarized is that calcium will flow into the cell. And from there, it will travel towards the sarcoposic reticulum which we have here, and open up the reanidine channel, right, or something equivalent to it. So we have down here a calcium-gated channel, which calcium will bind to, and then calcium will come out and will cause the cell to flood with calcium, 
And again, calcium is always going to be necessary for some muscle contraction. All right, well, technically in smooth muscle, that's not even always true. But for most cases, it is true, okay? And so this is very similar to what we saw in cardiac muscle, right? The calcium-mediated calcium release. Slightly different channels, a drug that affected a DHP receptor, and a reanidine receptor in cardiac muscle is not going to necessarily do the same thing in our, in, in our, in our smooth muscle. Now, the other thing that makes this a little more complicated, though, is that the cell does not necessarily have to depolarize for us to see calcium levels go up in the cell and for us to have muscle contraction. And this is because that the neurotransmitters that are released on the smooth muscle can eventually directly lead to the, the release of calcium. So let me show you how that looks, what that looks like. So we have a receptor here on the surface of the cell that is a receptor for norepinephrine. And again, this is going to be the neurotransmitter that most commonly activates smooth muscle. And it's this neurotransmitter that activates smooth muscle in the vascular system. So the norepinephrine binds to this receptor. The next thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a series of events in which one protein after the other is going to develop messages that are sent through the cell. So um, this is going to be a little confusing for people who haven't had biochemistry or cell bio, but I'm doing this for you guys who have, uh, and you get some flavor for what's happening. So uh, the first thing that will happen is we'll activate a G protein, which will then travel over and activate another protein that is found in the cell membrane, and this is called phospholipase C or PLC. So we've had one step lead to another step, okay? PLC does multiple things, but one thing it does do is it takes a molecule called PIP2, which is actually sets in the surface, inner surface of the cell membrane, and splits that into two compounds, right? One of these we're not going to talk about, it just remains in the cell membrane. The other one is called IP3. And this is a small molecule that can travel through the cell. So just to recap, what would happen if norepinephrine interacts with the re this receptor is that microseconds later, you would see an increase in IP3. A small molecule would start filling the cell. This IP3 would start filling the cell. This IP3 travels to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it activates a... IP3 gated channel. So the IP3 gated channel, as you might expect, is a calcium channel. And so whenever IP3 levels are high, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so what we've had here, we've really not done anything electrical, right? We've done something directly, or I should say somewhat indirectly, with the norepinephrine where it eventually leads to calcium levels going up. And so that calcium levels going up is what's going to lead uh, some to smooth muscle contraction. Now, how this calcium is handled gets a little complicated because actin and myosin are each activated by calcium in ways that are totally different than we talked about in skeletal and cardiac muscle. And if you'd like to learn more about that, um, I would suggest you uh, sign up for cell bio or, or you can take uh, maybe a biochemistry class. But it's a little beyond what we, what, what we want to do here. The next thing I'm going to talk about is what kind of things can activate smooth muscle? Because it turns out there's many things that can activate smooth muscle, um, and that's what gives it some of its power. As promised, a brief discussion of things that can activate smooth muscle. So if you might remember for just a second ago, if we look at smooth muscle, and I'm going to draw this in kind of a glob rather than like a nice little spindle, um, we have various things, receptors on the surface of the cell, we talked about a nor noradrenergic receptor, excuse me, adrenergic receptor that, that re is a receptor for norepinephrine on the surface of the cell. And when that's activated, it activated a various pathways that eventually led to an increase in calcium in the cell. And that increase in calcium in the cell, of course, will cause the cell to contract more. However, there are other events in this cell that could act in the same way, a, a, a multiple step process that would cause calcium levels to go down, right, and cause this muscle to relax. So we have things that can cause vaso, 
constriction. Right, because when this muscle contracts, it's going to cause the tube that it's making uh, making up uh, going to cause that tube to get smaller. So we'd have vasoconstriction. It also could be vasodilation if the cell relaxes. Right, the tube would get larger. So we could have different factors that are causing this. So I've drawn the norepinephrine on this side because this is going to cause muscle contraction, excuse me, muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. And we're going to talk about some other factors that uh, could activate vasodilation or uh, other things as well. So first of all, a lot of different things can activate vasoconstriction. So for example, we can have receptors that can detect other compounds. Another compound that's detected by these cells is a hormone called angiotensin, which we will talk about when we talk about controlling blood pressure. It's released from the kidney in a complicated process, and as the name suggests, it causes tension or vasoconstriction in blood vessels. Angio is a word that's associated with vessels. So that's another vasoconstrictor. It essentially is going to be another receptor on the surface that leads to a complicated series of steps to calcium levels going up. Other things that can cause vasoconstriction in ways that we don't necessarily quite understand is shear, and shear is the force of a red blood cells as they run through the system. They're going to stretch, they're going to interact with the walls of a blood vessel. That generates some friction. That friction is, can cause the vessels to contract. And we don't actually understand how that works, but you can imagine there's some sort of mechanical receptor that eventually leads to higher calcium levels. If there is high O2 in the area, we can have vasoconstriction. If there is low CO2, we can have vasoconstriction. And there's a whole variety of other things that can cause vasoconstriction. Some of these are strictly local. So the high O2 and low CO2 are local factors. And so locally, this little bit of a vessel is measuring O2 or CO2 levels and responding by constricting. Let's go over here to vasodilation, things that are going to cause the cells to, um, you know, to be re re more relaxed. So our old friend acetylcholine can act as a vasodilator. Uh, it's not necessarily a direct interaction, but in some places there are receptors for acetylcholine that will cause the cell to, to have lower levels of calcium and hence it will become more relaxed and will have vasodilation. A hormone called atrial neuropeptide, so it's your atrial natriuretic peptide, which we'll talk about when we talk about uh, the kidney and controlling blood pressure. It's released from the heart and it will travel throughout the body, activating receptors. So here's a little AMP receptor. And again, activating a series of steps which lead to low calcium, lead to vasodilation. If we have low oxygen or high CO2, these will also cause vasodilation. So these are some local factors that change uh, the dilation of a vessel. Probably the one that's most famous because you've seen this advertised a lot, is a molecule called nitric oxide. This is a gas that is made and released locally, and it causes vasodilation in blood vessels. Where have you heard this? Well, this is the compound that will be produced in greater quantities when you take Viagra. And so if you take Viagra, the cells that make nitric oxide um, and your genitals are going to become more active, causing vasodilation, causing more blood flow to the area. Uh, so that is a small sampling of some of the things that activate smooth muscles, either causing them to become less active, you know, more relaxed, or become more active, more contracted. So I'll see you guys on Friday. Have a great weekend. Or have a